The Cambridge interview process is um, it's very important to see this as one part of the assessment. So we look at many things about each candidate. In our minds when we're doing an interview, the sorts of things we're thinking about are whether or not the uh, person in front of us has the right kind of background knowledge needed for our courses, uh, whether we think they'd be successful in our kind of teaching environment. And to put it in a nutshell really, can they think? Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. Let's take a seat. Oh, yeah. Hi, Hi, I'm Nick. Hi. Nick Cutler. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Hello there. Um, just as we start this interview, I want to give you a bit of an outline of what's going to come next. Um, so we're going to start off with a question from Nick, and then we're going to talk a little bit about some unseen material. At the end of the interview, there'll be some time for you to ask any questions. If you have any, you don't have to have any. If there's anything that we say that doesn't make sense or that you'd like us to repeat or rephrase, please do just say. We'd be more than happy to do that. Okay. okay. And we will make notes as we go along as well. Please don't be thrown by that. Okay. Okay? okay. You shouldn't be surprised to find those interviewing you are taking notes during the interviews. This is because they need to remind themselves of topics which have been covered, both during and in subsequent discussion of the interview performance. What we're expecting out of students in those interviews is firstly that they are listening really carefully to what they're being asked. And we're interested to find out how people are thinking. So in their responses, if they can take us through their own thought processes, then that's great because it means that we can see how they're exploring those ideas. We'll start off, um, Ang Harrod, by um, talking to you about the essays that you've sent in and then we'll move on to one or two other topics that come out of your personal statement um, as, as the interview goes on. In one of your essays, you were talking about uh, the theory of functionalism, that things are kind of designed for purpose. Um, in your archaeological or anthropological reading, have you come across that as an idea, as a sort of a school of thought? Um, yeah, I've definitely come across... That idea comes across a lot, actually. Um, and there's definitely interlinkings between sociology and, and especially social anthropology mm -hmm. and that idea. Um, like the like society works as a body through the organs. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily something I believe in. I don't think um, the problem with these kind of broad theories that is that they generalise too much. I think, and there are too many exceptions. In the arts and social sciences, we will often make use of a student's UCAS personal statement and their supplementary questionnaire that they fill in specifically for Cambridge. We're not evaluating the quality of their writing in the statement. We're asking them to say some more about things they have told us about themselves, about their extracurricular academic engagement, and about their interest in the subject that they want to read. Anne Harrod, I was interested to see that in your personal statement you mention um, archaeology and that you've been doing some things in that field after you've uh, finished your A-levels. Can you tell me a little bit about what you've been doing and how you've been exploring that? that area? I think um, with archaeology I've been trying to build up a broad, not a, like a basic kind mm -hmm. of foundation knowledge because I've never studied it. My interest started in, in programs about Egyptology mm -hmm. and, and seeing exhibitions of that, of that sort in places like the British Museum, that kind of sparked my interest so mm -hmm. I wanted to try and understand that more okay. through reading an introductory book. For a technical interview like uh, natural sciences or engineering or mathematics, then what we're looking for is how teachable they are. We're looking at how interested in the material they are, how they can take an idea and develop that, even if it's something that they perhaps haven't necessarily seen before. So it's going to start by sketching a function, and the function yeah. that I'm going to write down you've probably not seen before, but okay. I'm fairly sure that you've all seen the pieces of that function. Okay. So if I write down function is y is equal to sine x divided by x. Okay, yeah. And what I would like you to do is sketch the behaviour of that function between minus 2 pi and 2 pi. And so if you can sketch some axes for me and give that a go. First of all, I'm going to start and get some of the main points that I need to mm -hmm. work out. So I'm going to start with x is equal to 0. Okay, so if I can just stop you there for a second, because yep. x is equal to zero is a little bit tricky. 
So yeah. choosing some points is a good idea, absolutely, yeah. but we might just come back to that one. So are there any other points that you know the values of? Um, pi mm -hmm. is a okay. fairly good one. Okay. Um, so sine of pi will be zero. And so zero divided by pi is zero. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Even when she was getting to the stage of being uncertain about what to draw, and you could see the hesitation, she would nevertheless draw something, and that gave the opportunity to say, well, yes, that's sort of in the right direction. You need to change this a little bit. So that would be... <laughs> yeah, have a scribble if yeah. it helps. Uh, what was this one? That was two-thirds. Mm -hmm. What's this one? That's minus... Two thirds of pi. Oh yeah. So that'll be more like minus two ninths. Yeah. Good so to be a lot smaller. If candidates are very hesitant and very unwilling to write things down or say things, it's very difficult for us to help them. So keeping the dialogue going is very, very important. Uh, and I think Hannah was very good at that. The questions we ask at interview are designed to push the candidates and to make them think hard. What you hope to do is to start with something which they will be able to answer, but to get progressively more difficult as you go through the problem. And often the candidate who thinks they haven't done very well will have done well because they'll have actually progressed further through the problem. We would expect candidates by the end of the interview to feel that there was something that they haven't been able to answer. Starting with something that hopefully we've already covered in some degree and you should know, what role do bases actually play in the hereditary nature of DNA? Uh, so uh, a triplet code, so uh, three bases uh, together code for one amino acid um, and then different combinations of those codons in DNA build up a chain of amino acids and code for proteins. Okay, so why is it three? Why is, it, why is the codon made up of three bases? Why not just um, one base? Because you're not, the three bases are needed so that you can have different combinations to code for uh, different amino acids. There's only four bases, so right. if you only had a, a single um, base, mm -hmm. you would only be able to code for four okay. uh, amino acids. Whereas we have uh, a triplet code which codes for 20 different amino acids. Is it 20? How many combinations can you have with... With, with three. Uh, I'm going to write something down. Yeah. So... Oliver gave a very positive interview, actually. I think he answered the questions very well. What I particularly liked was that he didn't give up. He kept on trying to work out answers, and he was listening to the information that we were giving him, and you'd see flashes every so often. We'd go, oh, of course, that's that. I've connected it together. I've made... And that's exactly the kind of thing that I'd be looking for. Well, let, let's think about this. If you have one amino... Uh, one base, sorry, you can obviously code for as you said, four different amino acids, right? So you could have A, T, G, C. If you now have two, what's the combination? So I've got um, 12, would I have? A bit more than 12. I'd have A, I want A, A, right, so I could have 16. 16, okay. Yeah. So when you have a triplet, what can you get? Um, so I've now got, 64. 64. Yeah. So can 64 code for 20? It could code for 64 different amino acids. It could do up to 64 right. potentially, couldn't it? Yeah. It can be quite difficult, I think, when you come into an interview situation to remember that we want you to do well. So if you can take a moment to gather your thoughts and make sure that you understand the question that's being asked of you and what you want to say in response to that, you look as though you've kind of got a sense of what it is that you're trying to say in response to the questions. And I think Natalie handled that really well. She took a few moments to reflect and she thought about the kinds of things that she was interested in without ever dodging the question. She always talked about relevant material, but she did it in a way that I think allowed her to express her own interests in the subject. This shows you total fertility rates okay. um, by NUTS2 regions in Europe, and it's averaged between 2006 and 2008. Okay. I just want to start off really by asking you if you could describe the pattern that you see there. So I can see that um, in West Europe, the fertility rates are generally high, well higher, um, but within each country there's variation. So why do you think the patterns might look the way they do, particularly in Western Europe, which you identified immediately? I'd say cultural factors play quite a big role, so the expe expectations of how big families could be. 
um, and also maybe welfare measures also bear a role. So um, the provisions of the state and how that um, it may encourage or discourage people to um, bring up families. I wonder if I could ask you to speculate on what you think this map of total fertility rates will look like in 20 years' time. I would say that possibly the fertility rates in the UK and France might decline a little bit. Um, Why might that be? That might be to do with the changing role of women, so their expectations um, of their careers yes. and um, I suppose it's, it's quite difficult to say because there are so many factors that sort of come into it that you can't really speculate that much until it, sort of, until it happens. Okay, certainly a complicated picture. Thank you very much. Thanks. We run a holistic admissions process, so we try and collect as much information as we can about a candidate. A lot of that comes from the paper record, so a record of examinations, for example, the personal statement, the reference from the school. The interview is just one component of that whole process. It's not the be-all and the end-all. It can tell us important information about a candidate, but it's not necessarily uh, the most important factor in our considerations. The single piece of advice I'd give any student coming for interview is to listen carefully to the questions that they're being asked. And if you don't understand a word, ask for clarification. Be yourself as much as possible. We are assessing you to see whether we can teach you effectively. So the more you are like you in your interview, the better.